a passage to India, wonderful fool, and heart of darkness. All these books share the common theme of tracing the journey of three characters, Adela in passage, Marlowe in heart of darkness, and Gaston in wonderful fool into foreign land. But these plots share more than a common theme. For decades, we believed that these novels, A Passage to India, Wonderful Fool, and Hot of Darkness, were fiction. But not only do we now have evidence that these stories were real, but also that they're interrelated. Adela, Marlowe, Gaston. They all knew each other. In fact, they were regular correspondents. Archaeologists have recently uncovered groundbreaking evidence of correspondence between Adela, Marlowe, and Gaston. These letters not only match up perfectly with plot elements, but they also include the personal thought and reflections of Adela, Marlowe, and <laughs> Gaston. In these letters, Adela related her experiences in the British Raj in India, more specifically, Chandrapur. Malo his experiences in Belgium-dominated Congo. Gaston in post-war Japan. Adela lied to Malo. I know my passage to India has the ultimate goal of my marriage to Ronnie, but it's more than that. It's the beginning of a new life for me. I'm glad to escape the calm western mists of Europe. I want adventure, excitement. I believe India, the pinnacle of exotic Orient, will be my adventure. Adela wanted to see the real India. We both did. We rode to India discussing these wild possibilities. Being younger, Adela was naturally more excited. I knew life did not always give us what we wanted, but Adela had not yet learned this. I want to see the real India. We had made such a romantic voyage across the Mediterranean and through the sands of Egypt to the harbour of Bombay, to find only a gridiron of bungalows at the end of it. Adela was not the only one seeking adventure. Malo, with the spirit of sailor in his veins, sought to explore the uncharted lands of the Congo. Marlow had always had a fascination with maps. He writes back to Adela saying, Now when I was a little chap, I had a passion for maps. I would look for hours at South America or Africa or Australia and lose myself in all the glories of exploration. But there was in it one river especially, a mighty big river that you could see on the map resembling an immense snake uncoiled with its head in the sea, its body at rest curving afar over a vast country, and its tail lost in the depths of the land. I understand your thirst for adventure. It, too, is what led me to the Congo. I do not know what exactly I would find, but nevertheless I knew it would make a thrilling tale. Neither Adela nor Marlowe knew exactly what they were looking for. They had vague visions of grandeur, of meeting natives and seeing new lands. The key difference between the two was that while Marlowe's job in the company aligned with his expectations for the Congo, Adela's main purpose of marrying Rani realistically did not tie in with her desire to see the real India. Repeatedly in Passage to India and Heart of Darkness, we see this contrast. When Adela arrives, Rani and the British folk in India are adamantly against the idea of Adela interacting with any Indian people. In a sense, the British environment that she's in prohibits her from realizing her expectations. Marlowe, on the other hand, comes face to face with the natives and the brutality of the Congo. It's his job to find Kurtz and along the way he cannot help but interact with the natives on his ship and deal with the mighty Congo River that he had so desired to see as a child. 
Into this mix, we add Gaston Bonaparte, a descendant of Napoleon who travels to Japan. Ostracized in France for his horse-like face and his childlike mind, Gaston sought a new beginning in Japan. He tells Adela, You and Marlow talk about adventure, but adventure seems to follow me wherever I go. I don't need to look for it. Already in France, I have been through more excitement than I ever wanted. I only want to help people, to find a place where I belong. I want to find good people. I know they're out there. I've failed three times to pass the entrance examination to the mission seminary, so I won't be able to become a missionary priest. Still, I must go to Japan. I will become a self-made missionary. Gaston, like Adela, did not have a clear set goal. Just as Adela had a vague idea about seeing some real India, Gaston had a vague idea of finding good. But like Marlo, whose job in the company fit well with his desire to explore the Congo, Gaston's visit to Japan directly matched with his goals of going to Japan. Right off the bat, Marlo and Gaston seem to have an advantage over Adela in terms of fulfilling their hopes. But how did Adela, Marlo, and Gaston's expectations affect their experiences in India, the Congo, and Japan? When Adela arrives, she is generally displeased with what she sees. She interacts mainly with British people, and the Indian people she does interact with are painfully polite. She has found herself in a microcosm of England in India, and this, in her mind, hinders her from her adventure. Unaccustomed to uh, the Anglo-Indian ways and social norms, and to the displeasure of the English community, Adela and Mrs. Moore befriend an Indian man named Aziz. They make arrangements to visit the Marabar Caves, an experience that Adela is confident will expose her to the real India. When Adela, affected by the hot sun, mistakenly accuses Aziz of assaulting her in the caves, she further mobilizes the English against the Indians. Aziz is thrown into prison and Adela is plagued by an echo. At the court case, however, Adela realizes that Aziz did not harm her and she withdraws her accusation. Even though Adela comes clean and loses her echo, her honesty does not win her support from the British nor the Indians. All alone with no chance of ro marrying Roni, Adela returns to England. Adela writes, I had always meant to tell the truth, and nothing but the truth. I don't understand. I told the truth. I freed Aziz. But by doing so, I had renounced my own people. I don't regret telling the truth, however. I have no longer any secrets. My echo has gone. I was brought up to be honest. The trouble is, it gets me nowhere. I'm writing to you on my passage to England. I must pick up my old life there. Perhaps become a seamstress. In the end, Adela gets the excitement that she had been longing for. But the excitement was nothing like she ever imagined or wanted. She loses people who are close to her. Moreover, everybody hates her, the British community and the English community both. Marlowe replies, I too have been disheartened by my journey to the Congo. I was not naive like my aunt, who sincerely believed that I would become something like an emissary of light, something like a lower sort of apostle, weaning those ignorant millions of natives from their horrid ways. I knew, and I told her so, that the company was run for profit. Even though I knew that the Congo was not the place of redemption my aunt made it out to be, I was still disgusted by the sheer greed and fixation on ivory. The word ivory rang in the air, was whispered, was sighed. You would think they were praying to it. But the obsession with ivory was not the most striking thing Marlowe discovered in the Congo. He writes, My mission was to find Kurt. I had heard so many great things about that man, Gaston. But Kurtz was also nothing I expected. After everything I heard about his intellect and his skills, I was horrified to see his deteriorated state. Can you imagine it? Fences with, with decorative human heads. And the man himself, he looked nothing like I had imagined. He looked like an animated image of death carved out of old ivory. 
Adela, I understand your echo. I too suffered a similar fate with Kurtz's last words. I cannot repeat them in this letter, but they still haunt me. Like Adela, Marlowe's adventure was more awful than he expected. Still, he left the Congo having fulfilled his duty. Along the way, he had some interesting experiences, and he comes out with a good story to tell his friends. However, he was severely affected by his interaction with Kurtz, notably evidenced by his echo. Marlowe chooses to keep this to himself. Even though his expectations of his job were rather realistic, his expectations of Kurtz were elaborate. Therefore, when he sees Kurtz, he is shaken and disappointed. Meanwhile in Japan, Gaston searches for the good in people. After his brief stay with Tomoe and Takamori, Gaston decides to wander Japan. Along the way, he meets several people, a prostitute, a fortune-telling sensei, and an ill assassin named Endo. Although these people are generally considered lower on the social structure, their social status does not hinder Gaston from discovering that they are good people. Unfortunately, because of his mysterious and untimely disappearance into the Japanese mountains, Gaston was not able to inform Marlowe and Adela of his last days in Japan. Still, we can gather bits and pieces from Shisako Endo's novel, Wonderful Fool. When Endo informs Gaston of his plot to murder, Gaston tells Endo, No, Endo-san, no. You mustn't. I know how hard it is to be ill. I know how you feel about your brother's execution. But even so, you mustn't. To hate men. To hate. Nothing but a dead end. Gaston saved Endo's life. When Kobayashi tried to kill Endo with a shovel, Gaston shielded Endo with his hand. This was Gaston's last recorded act. Gaston arguably found the most success in his trip to a foreign land. He was looking for the good in people, and despite any bad actions, for example, in the case of Endo, who was a murderer, he continues to trust these people. Had he not been a fool, he probably would have recognized that Tomoe was being mean to him, or that Endo was taking advantage of him. In other words, Gaston achieves his goal by choosing to achieve it. He looks for the good in people, even criminals like Endo, until he finds it. Then, he mysteriously disappears. The expectations of Adela, Marlowe, and Gaston not only shape their experiences, but also their perceptions of what they experienced.